we are all familiar with traditional disciplines such as uh, physics mathematics chemistry philosophy psychology sociology you, you know there are so many of these now the words science education which are also a part of our icer name tag science education forms a discipline zone which is researched worldwide uh, but somehow it has a very small footprint in uh, our country and it is also not known uh, to not well known to most of us now there is a pertinent need for us to do a lot of work in this field of science education and this was one of the key goals why this department of science education has been set up at icer pune now the motivation behind this lecture series is to interact with the science education experts in our country to have them share their experiences and their contributions with us and also most importantly to enlighten us about what science education entails and to tell us about the challenges in science education so today to open this series our expert is dr jyotsna vijapurkar jyotsna is an astronomer a science educator and also a retired faculty of the homi bhava center for science education one of her main is curriculum development talk why the earth does not fall and other questions for science education is is very intriguing so let's get to it right away over to you jyotsna thank you aparna thank you for inviting me it's always a pleasure to talk about this really delightful field that i was involved in for a couple of decades so let me start start with sharing the screen okay so as i was saying it was one of the first questions i encountered while trying to teach solar system and i went whole oh, you know, my god this is what they are thinking so in fact a kid from one of the orphanages we worked with came and asked me didi prithvi girti kyun nahi hai and i remember <laughs> asking the child giregi to kahan giregi <laughs> it had flabbergasted me and the answer the child gave me was pani mein so uh, so to start with i think i think a lot of the problems that we encounter are challenging which may not apply to the audience here today but in general science is a very challenging subject and a, lo a lot of it has to do with the way the curriculum is designed because there is something way back in the 50s jean piaget actually told us you know he researched and found out that there are cognitive developmental stages in children so trying to teach something before children are cognitively ready before they can understand some concept is actually a, an exercise in futility so for example if you i'll just go over one of them in front of children you take two identical glasses filled with water and you pour from one into the other where the uh, surface area is smaller so the height is more and children are asked is the amount of water in the same they say no this is it's more in this so they do not conserve volume even though it is done in front of them now i should also caution that there has been a lot of critique of this work i mean whether the way the questions were asked like if you ask them are they equal and then ask them are they equal the children expect that they should the answer would be different so right i know as far back as 2009 or 10 i have found papers which have tried to recreate and do it you know ask the question differently and see if the outcome is different but all that aside the bottom line is that there are cognitive developmental stages children are not ready for every concept at any age you cannot teach evolution in grade 1 no matter how bright the child is or how great a teacher you are children are simply not ready with the um, the ability to actually comprehend it okay so uh, so let me go back to the earth uh, uh, example so when the earth that when we teach children that the earth is round but it looks very flat because i mean just look out and so what they come up with and they are very active scientists if you ask me they come up with a model that fits the two conflicting ideas they are told it is round and they believe authority that's an extremely important part also of science education and uh, but they see that it is flat so they make up a completely coherent picture and to my mind i mean this is absolutely brilliant Okay, so we have an Earth where you see the sun and stars and all through a transparent dome, and here is the part where we live and trees grow, etc. And slightly younger children come up with a two Earth model. That the Earth, there is an Earth in the sky which is shown in our geography books, etc. And there is the Earth where we live. Now you understand why the child asked me, "Didi, Prithvi girti kyon nahi hai?" Because this is the Prithvi that will fall. 
right? So this, this was around age um, 10. In grade five, I started the unit, explored why they don't understand the earth is round. And I tried to figure out a way of teaching it without just telling them, because telling is not the same as teaching. So let me show you um, uh, some of the initial exercises I did with children and what uh, answer came with. If anyone, everyone can see. So we took globes to class. We had children make dolls and they said, walk the dog, on, right? So what they do is that they walk it, they, do, they don't do it this way. They keep the vertical fixed to the local vertical. And this doll starts and it goes sideways and it falls. And they say, tell me, so, see, nobody can live in the southern, right? So you have one, to, in order to start teaching them that the earth is round and we live on it, this was the thing that we had to approach. And so what we did was we made them make dolls. We kept reminding them that the feet of the doll has to be on the globe all the time. And uh, there were a whole lot of um, uh, concepts that, you know, that needed to be brought in together to make them. And it's a very large wall and we live on it. So I'm giving you some examples from the unit we developed. One was, of course, walking the doll, keeping the feet on the ground and not sideways. Uh, not have it walk sideways. And the other thing was uh, exercises on scaling. Take a strip of, uh, you know, uh, take a length of thread and put it on balls of different diameters and look straighter. So the approximation is that the earth is so large that it looks straight and they get it. So, so that's what we did. And of course, one diagnostic in our unit was they had to share the sky for these children, Aftab and Bhumi and Mini. Okay. And when you ask them where the earth would be for, uh, sorry, where the sky would be for a child and they tell you it's out of the paper, then mission accomplished. You've taught them the earth is round. And let me also uh, point out that this takes a couple of weeks for children to actually understand. Learning takes time and we never give enough time to children to learn things. Uh, it, it requires a lot of patience. I had children who had these teaching learning moments with me, you know, they would go home, think, talk to their mother, come back and ask me again, etc. So they were grappling with this change in the concept. So I'll come to that a little bit later. And here is an example of a textbook. I hope it's no longer in use from Gujarat, actually, for grade three. What they have done is they have thought, they have assumed that telling children something is the same as teaching them. And so it, it talks about the round earth and isn't it? Do you know what the earth looks like? See the picture, it's like an orange. This is what children come up with, the transparent half, a transparent hemisphere through which you see the sky and the hemisphere filled with soil on which we live. And the younger children come up with the two earth model, the one in the sky, the one we live on. And here is an exercise we did as a diagnostic where we asked them to shade the sky for these children. Can you see the different slides now? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. And um, so we asked them to share the sky and they shared for Bhumi, for Aftab correctly. And when you ask for this child, they say it's out of the page. So they know that they, uh, you know, we can't. So as I said, that was mission accomplished. So in this case, when the earth rotates on its axis, this whole thing about axis, an extremely abstract concept for grade three. And this is what the amount, the content was for that class. So what was wrong here? I'm giving this as an example of how textbooks are written and how curriculums, uh, curricula are adopted. So textbooks, um, quite apart from the fact, as you can see here, that was it, it was age inappropriate because even in grade five, it took us a couple of weeks to get this thing and we had to be very imaginative. We had to get them to, for example, make a little boat and trace Magellan's route so that they just start handling the earth like this, right? So that fixed vertical gets destroyed. So very subtle, um, pathways actually to get to the concept um, but apart from that textbooks have a lot of factual errors because if I had given this in a recent talk about um, there are textbooks in the US for example which talk about how the Coriolis force in a sink makes the water go one way or the other in different hemispheres which is completely wrong because it's a large scale force <laughs> or you can have Vibke or, you know, the seven colors of the rainbow. And I would challenge any of you, the monsoon is going to come shortly, go out and see if you can actually identify these seven colors. And, uh, or uh, there is this myth about how the taste buds are distributed. I'll just quickly um, go over those slides. So here's the Coriolis force, uh, which works, you know, at the hurricane um, on a very large kilometer scale. 
and uh, it's become such a business that uh, countries on the equator have actually made a business of getting tourists to pay for a demo of how the water goes in different directions. They manipulate it very well, very cleverly. And uh, this taste bud thing, the sour, bitter, you, you can do it yourself. Close your eye and try and all parts of the tongue can actually taste all, all these different tastes. So these myths get propagated if you don't act, if the way you write your textbooks um, and the mechanism or the process is not very robust. I have worked with state governments and I've often found that if, you are write, if they're writing textbooks for grade four, what they have as reference are a whole lot of grade four textbooks from different uh, um, states or from different uh, you know, boards. That's not how you can write a textbook. So I'll come to how we try to do this. So, and the textbooks, I mean, there are, these actually indicate the kind of shortcomings uh, of the process, right? So uh, language is often oversimplified because it's for children. You tell them plants make their own food, but the child has no idea what plant food is, or, you, you, or they can be extremely uh, technical. In grade four, I believe in NCRT a few years, some years ago, we had biotic and abiotic components of the environment. Oh my God. And this is what you're trying to teach a child in environmental science. Uh, teaching se sequences are often oversimplified because if you look at uh, how optics is dealt with in later years, you look at, uh, you know, the, when a light ray falls on a surface, it, all three things happen, right? There is reflection, there is refraction, and there is absorption. And we don't teach it that way. We say on mirrors, you have reflection. In, on glass uh, blocks, you have refraction. That is how we teach them. So reality and how we oversimplify and um, adopt teaching sequences are flawed. And there's a big difference between the two. And there is just too much def uh, emphasis on definition. I don't even know what this definition actually means. Matter occupies space. I mean, we're teaching this in grade four. Okay. And or this uh, extremely well-known, uh, well, not that well-known, uh, we found papers from Israel which talked about the difficulty of the cell is a structural and functional unit of an organism. The, if you ask them what is a cell, they'll give you this answer, but let me show you what they actually think of when they think of cells. A little bit later, I'll come to that slide. So what we need to do in our curriculum is to really consider what do we include in it? Why do we need to include in it? And why, why, do, why are some things better not included in the curriculum? I don't know. There is this obsession of Roti Kapra Magan, which may be fine as a political manifesto, but to um, you know, design an entire science unit on cloth and cloth making, et cetera, to me did not make, I wasn't very convinced that one needed to do that. And then we need to talk about the process of how we teach once the curriculum is uh, ready and also how we develop the curriculum, as I had already mentioned. And the, uh, another main thing, which goes back to my first slide about cognitive developmental stages, is at what grade do we teach them any concept that we think is important to teach. So when you do the textbook, when you make textbooks and design curricula without so much, um, you know, without such a deep look at um, what children can do at what age and which concepts are important. So I'll just give you, this is part, partially lighthearted. I have this 1858 book of natural philosophy. And in that there is a chapter on the inclined plane. And this is 2017 in a Maharashtra State Board. We still have a chapter on an inclined plane. I did not ever understand why we need to do simple machines at that age. It's almost like we're not looking at what are the con foundational concepts that need to be taught on which you can build later, but we just think, okay, inclined plane karenge, um, axle kardenge, you know, we, we, this is how our curricula tend to get written. So our approach was very different. We looked at where we are coming from. We knew, like, suppose we did the middle school, what did they learn in primary and where we are going? What is it that we are preparing them for in, in the later grade? That is how we started approaching our curriculum development. So the big picture was to focus on foundational concepts and the details were worked out through very intensive classroom work. We had to go back and forth. I'll show you that uh, slide a little bit later. Um, 
so say, uh, and the inputs no you you don't start completely blank right so inputs came from uh, from history of science children's conceptual development actually parallels the historical development of concepts for example force or um, or if you look at uh, an easier example to um, uh, think about now would be how life can form from mineral sources you know if you look up this paper it took over a couple of hundred years to understand that omni vivo ex vivo life can only come from life uh, and it came, it came from inputs from many different fields in biology people studying insects and mushrooms um, and uh, so that's actually a very good start and we I, we included our uh, concepts in our curriculum based on these kind of inputs and it's also a good pedagogic strategy because uh, somehow i feel that you know we we give them the output of years and decades or centuries of research in science and teach children and they feel they are responsible for not getting it it's their fault but if you tell them that the, you know the really brilliant minds in science in history actually grapple with the same problems that you have psychologically it's extremely satisfying to them this is something now that they can also do they figured out these kids can also figure out of course again it has to be age appropriate uh, and a difficulty level so i'm just giving you an example of um, a child telling me we ask them how do you get a worm in a pea so he said, this child is saying that before seeing uh, a worm in the pea there's always a hole in that pea so maybe the worm make made a hole and enter but sometimes this child has noticed that there is a worm even if you don't see a hole outside and they think maybe there is some chemical process inside that produce the worm which is exactly the thinking around pre pasture days okay so this is an example of history of science giving an input and uh, there is a lot of literature documenting students difficulties in fact um, i think it was susan carey who said in a paper that in the 80s it had become almost a cottage industry students mis uh, misconceptions in thermodynamics in evolution in light in force you name a concept it was there and so and a lot of it also came from self reflection i mean i had the same problem with the round earth i didn't i didn't disbelieve the earth was round but the thing that bothered me when i was in grade 4 was that the person on the other side was upside down Okay, so, or the fact that when I, I mean, it hit me only a decade ago that I had always thought of the biological cell as flat because that's how it's always drawn in two D, and even looking through the microscope doesn't help because it still looks flat. So small strategies like focusing on a lower layer of cells in an onion skin in the microscope, you know, physically going down in that depth can give you the third dimension. so this very i mean it has to be extremely nuanced you can't just take and tell children the cell is a functional unit and and think they have understood it one of the th studies we had taken up our bio biological cells and we had children make a model never once did we tell them it has to be three dimensional but we talked about what the cells functions are we talked about all the wonderful things how it's uh, it has a cytoplasm that the cell wall or the cell membrane encloses and over a period of time as teaching progressed they went from flat to a three dimensional cell model i mean earlier when we gave them balloons and uh, plastic bags and clay they would take it and flatten it first before making the model here you will see where they have a little bit of a third dimension but all the organelles are again flattened on top and and pasted on top mm. so uh, so it was about what to teach you can get inputs from you know by looking at foundational concepts and um what children can handle at that age so and when to teach it again this requires a lot of work going up and down grade levels and figuring out sometimes just one grade level makes a big difference i'll be showing an example of that in particulate nature of matter so the uh, typical sequence of figuring out when to teach something that we uh, carried out at the homi bhava center was that we would have initial discussions with questions from the teacher and activities tasks like the round earth that i gave an example of uh, would they, they would often be teaching as well as diagnostic i don't believe i think that even exercises you give them uh, at the back of the textbook is not just to test the understanding but they should also help the child understand things that is how they need to be designed so i have not touching um, assessment at all in my talk today but that's something to bear in mind 
and so based on you know kind of diagnosis i gave an example of it figure out if it's possible for children to continue if yes then we develop the unit and if it is not we figure out why i'll give you an example shortly if they are not ready for the concept just abandon it go to the next higher class if it's because they don't have prerequisite you repeat the same steps again at that age and then continue if it's a success if not of course you're back here and if it is possible to continue develop further okay so the example i'll give you is of particulate nature of matter this we tried in grade 6 and uh, remember that many uh, boards is grade 6 has basic chemistry equations which children cannot balance first of all mass conservation is not a constraint at that age on top of that particulate nature is not known so uh, so when we found out what they thought of atoms when we uh, you know uh, through discussions and worksheets they said atoms must be living things because they are constantly moving which we had told them so in their daily experience is the living things that move constantly and only living things are made of molecules i don't know where this came from So when we did this diagnostic, we had we drew like a one square meter, one cubic meter on the board, and we asked them, you know, the kids came up with symbols for different gases which they knew about from their classes, and we said, what is between these molecules? And the answer was air. So this is a very good example of um, the cognitive developmental stage because they cannot, they, you can tell them that these are molecules that are around you in air. but they still think of it as a medium in which the particles are moving they don't think of air itself as being particulate so we tried this in grade 7 but then they had not had the kind of uh, um classrooms or teaching that uh, our kids go through so there were a host of problems here um where if you could see individual molecules would a molecule in liquid water and water vapor look the same only seven said yes no 10 partially same no answer to or difference between copper sulfate and copper sulfur and oxygen from air in a glass was not clear so and we are teaching them chemical equations in grade 6 without these prerequisites right so no idea of how many men, elements in the world some said there are billions and atoms have no weight these were the problems they had i won't be going too deep into how we actually um, you know approach this unit and we had a tremendously successful chemistry unit every time they came back to our summer camp we would ask them what would you like to do this year and they would say chemistry <laughs> which we were told was one of the most daunting subjects and the kids were having a, you know fun doing it so we did this thought experiment where part of the um, water i mean obviously this can't be a real uh, real life experiment so we asked them what happens when you heat it and some of it vaporizes and we asked them if the mass is same they say no is the number of molecules same yes so some of again as i said mass conservation is not a constraint so then we discussed with them and the discussion brought out the underlying conceptual difficulties which was there was tremendous confusion between mass and density and there were indications from other contexts too for example if we ask them if you crumple a sheet of paper and you have the same paper like take two a4 sheets crumple one and keep one flat and they say the crumpled one weighs more that was their expectation so we did a unit on balance we did a unit on density then moved on to atoms so now let me come to how to teach it so what kind of a facility uh, what classroom can facilitate the unearthing of these issues as well as helping the child learn those concepts it's everything here actually goes hand in hand trying to tease out separate strands here but they can't be completely disparate Way to do that is to have children learning science by doing science, and by this I do not mean experiments about. That's one of the biggest myths that most people have that experiments should not be done. So it's about generating questions, it's about tentative solutions, it's about investigating further, weighing evidence. We've had debates in class. I mean, there's a very common uh, misconception among children that heavier things will sink and lighter things will float. So if you take a clever combination of pairs, right, where you have lighter but more dense. and you take that those that pair and ask for a prediction they always tell you the heavier one will sink so we actually had children debate this in class and discussions and collaboration with peers let's face it in our classroom it's always teacher to student it's never student to student whereas that is actually an extremely important part of science learning and uh, i'm sorry about the typo here but arriving at the answer 
So in short, what all these are telling you is that we want to engage students in scientific inquiry. So what does an inquiry classroom look like? How would the teacher's role be different in a classroom where science is taught as an inquiry and the way it is taught now in most of our classes? So in traditional, the teacher's role, the teacher's responsibility is to expound clearly. Teacher explains the concept with the help of demonstration and hands-on verification activity. No experiment is actually used as a learning thing. It's to verify. You tell them something that, and then you show the experiments and say, see, in inquiry, te in inquiry teaching, the teacher's responsibility is to elicit, to challenge and scaffold or support student thinking and encourage wider responses from the class. And the teacher engages and guides students through investigations, making observations, and arriving at explanations. In commonplace classes, people call it traditional, and I find that uh, I, I have a little bit of a discomfort with that because you can have fantastic traditions in inquiry. So teacher engages students in questioning that does not lead to discussion. Teacher goes through a sequence of questioning, accepting or correcting answers where necessary, but rarely follows up with further probing. And students' utterances are often in response to teachers' questions and usually consist of single detached words, many a times in chorus. In inquiry classes, teacher consistently engages students in open-ended questions, often leading to discussion and debate where observations, assumptions, and reasoning are challenged by the teacher or challenged by the other students. I mean, my one of my um, you know most rewarding moments was when a child considered average in his class challenged me and he accused me in the density experiment I was mentioning. He said, "You dropped this slowly and you dropped this with force. That's why it sank, even though it's lighter." You know, uh, so th that's fantastic. If they are challenging authority, what more do you want for a person, you know, to engage in science? And students' utterances are not restricted to direct answers to teachers' questions and are expressed in whole phrases or sentences and may be tentative. We've had in a classes children, you know, I still remember this girl getting up and starting an answer, stopping halfway and telling, ma'am, I need to think more. Okay, so they realize it's not always there. Let me think a little more. And the kind of questioning the teacher uh, engages in and the purpose it serves is also important. This is one of the research... Uh, projects that I had done with the student. Uh, forget about the, this is just taken from a paper, so forget uh, these uh, symbols, codes. But if you look at a teacher's question in inquiry and traditional classes, you find that in the traditional class, for example, in the beginning, there are a whole lot of questions, so much so that we had to break this here, right? But they're all questions that are low cognitive demand. For example, it would be, what did you eat today? So all students answer, right? So they ask a lot of questions in the beginning and then it stops. The rest of the teaching does not involve question, answer, exploration, etc. And as, uh, but if you look at the inquiry classes, it, it, it was sustained and guiding the entire class towards the question. I mean, I can't go into the details of the nature of questions here. It's there in the paper. If anyone interested can look it up. And, so we basically broke it into exploratory questions, which are very high in traditional, about generating ideas. You ask students, for example, I'll give you an example. Because they, they had this notion that uh, life can form from mineral sources. We ask mosquitoes live about a month. And yet when it rains, you have far more mosquitoes. So where do they go between the monsoon and the next monsoon? Or how do mosquitoes come in the next monsoon? This is one of the questions we'd ask them. And so there were all kinds of theories. And one of, one of them was that uh, they form again from dirt, from mud, from dirty water, which is what they had been taught, right? Dirty water, you, you need to make sure there's no water accumulating in all these bases mm -hmm. because mosquitoes form from there. So this kind of exploration, getting their ideas and guiding in a, towards the right answer happens in an inquiry class. And you'll see that towards the end also, the number of questions, and what you need to note is the number of questions in the traditional classes. Steadily, well, not steadily declining, but as time goes on, there are hardly any in some cases. And uh, so I come to the rather important part of teacher's questions in the classroom. Um, <laughs> Intonation actually matters much more than you might think. So there is an example one of my colleagues, Professor Gambhir, used to give, you know, 
you ask them um, if i can switch to marathi if people hear ram jaye ka asla jangalat ram jaye ga ise jangal mein no chorus answer uh, ram jaye ga ki nahi ise jangal mein ha so your intonation can tell the children what answer is expected and let me tell you children are whizzes at figuring out what the expected answer is their whole school life is about giving the expected answer so they have all these ways of figuring them out and what you ask matters more than you might think are you asking for sentence sentence completion are you asking for the correct word you know and this is called reflection this is called refraction okay and what you accept as the answer matters more than you might think are you asking do you accept the chorus do you accept a single associated word or do you say can you put that in a full sentence okay and this is amazing there's actually a research paper from the 80s by mary bird row which i found was fascinating when you ask a question if you do not wait long enough not every every student attempts to answer it okay but getting teachers to increase the wait time from 2 to 5 seconds was a huge challenge because the, they had been so ingrained in their practice ask a question get an in, instant answer and then the other things about classroom dynamics is at home are the questions being directed if you go to any um, regular classroom in any regular school you'll find that it's the first second third fourth rankers who are the ones who have their hands up and the whole thing is about saying teacher i know the answer teacher i know the answer it's not about the whole class learning something and therein lies a huge problem there are um, you know um, if the, the the emotional uh, uh, consequences of this for children are huge and if you are not paying attention to that in their formating formative years what are we doing in a school education system right and uh, if the if the and do other students have a different answer if one student gave one do others have a different answer do we explore that in our classroom are answers different from just the one correct answer all wrong or could they be intermediate steps in the thought process which eventually lead to the right answer right because learning takes time it's not going to be telling them one thing and getting the answer pat like that when you ask the question it's going to be this process that i had given an example of with the atoms with the earth with the cell and so on um and and here we should also talk about teachers responses because in an ideal classroom you will have students asking questions too and lot of students asking lot of questions so now what was what is the teacher's role what if the teacher doesn't know the answer to the question we actually did we had done a study with one ward of mumbai and there was a teacher who said you know one teacher came and did a demo and said i don't know the name of this land doesn't matter i want you to look at the roots and everyone attacked this person and they said how can you as a teacher say you don't know the answer and i was thinking but that's the best thing that can happen in a science class we don't know the answer let's find out let's see how we can find it out right uh, what do what if you do know the answer but that children can grasp you just give it away or if you do know the answer but children cannot grasp i mean a 5 year old will ask you why is the sky red at sunset you're not going to be teaching the maxwell's equation right and very important what if a student gives the correct answer immediately do you just say yes good and move on what is it that you can do i'm purposely not giving answers to all of these i would like the audience to think about them and so when we did this curriculum so painstakingly and you know we uh, we took a lot of data this was done over several years we had a core group of students with who were with us from grade 5 to 8 and the enculturation was very strong so if we had maybe 10 students and the other five or six or eight that new ones that kept joining they also learned to ask questions they also learned to discuss they also learned all of this so uh, at the end of their uh, their um, the teaching episodes we would uh, not one or at the end of a year or two or at the end of the entire uh, program their experiences that they reported to us many of them voluntarily and many through worksheets that were designed to uh, get feedback students reported a sense of wonder they reported an enjoyment of the intellectual challenge so uh, those of you who may read a little bit more about uh, um, bygotsky who looked at how social interactions play an extremely important role in a student's learning 
uh, we'll come across what is called the zone of proximal development. When the, the concepts you teach at any given age, they need to be just within reach with some effort. They cannot be something that is impossible to grasp and they cannot be something too easy, then they lose interest. So that intellectual challenge, I need not tell the scientists in this audience that that's what keeps, keeps them going. Um, then uh, they, they reported that they had developed a habit of questioning. This was corroborated with, from their peers, from their school teachers and from their parents. And uh, they were very good at argumentation. Um, they were questioning authority and they developed a longer and deeper engagement with the subject that was being taught. And there were affective changes, the emotional changes. They reported, for example, greater self-confidence. They, they even said that some of the benefits of learning science the way they had done in our uh, program um, increased marks in other subjects. So it went across domains. And so um, I have taken up approximately 40 minutes. So I would like to end here with this on how to teach science. So the way I have, um, you know, what I tried to sort of give a flavor of, of how we did the curricul curriculum development. It's called this conceptual ch change framework. I refer back to that earth concept where they made up something within the bounds of their knowledge, made up, made up something that was perfectly coherent picture for them of the world, right? And our job as teachers is to move them from there to the scientifically correct concept and still have them, uh, you know, still have them accepted at that age. So this question mark here, I hope I have thrown, um, given you some flavor of the kinds of things that you can study in a science education uh, program and uh, the possibilities of things you can pursue. So I will stop here. Thank you, Jotna. That was uh, that was a very inspiring uh, lecture with so many things to think about, right from curriculum to how to teach, to how students learn. And uh, I'm sure uh, everybody will go home with so many questions in their mind in different areas. Uh, there are a couple of uh, two, three questions in the chat box. So the first question is from uh, Garvid Bansal, who is our second year uh, BSMS student. He is asking, why is there a sudden big jump from eighth to ninth grade in science? And a, a follow-up to that from Mayura, I don't know if Mayura is from ISAR, and from 10th to 11th. So basically, the, they're talking about a jump in the curriculum, and if and they want I to mean, know why. I'm hoping that my talk kind of gave an answer about the uh, amount of thought that goes into how a curriculum is designed. So that's, she's right, there's definitely a problem. There is no continuity of concepts or of difficulty level uh, for each grade. So this is something when it asks for projects, this is one of the things I had considered. If they can trace across years, what, how the con a particular concept is developed. Okay. So, so basically we don't, we don't know, right? Why, uh, why the textbook I would say jump? it does not be, okay, let me put it this way. It probably requires a lot more thought and effort to design the curriculum from 9th to 10th and to 11th than, has, than is evident so far, as she pointed out. Uh, Mayura has a question, how to decide the age appropriateness of the content? Is there any test which we can apply to the content to decide what is the appropriate age for it? Yeah, that's what I gave an example of, right? You need to listen to their questions. You need to listen to their answers and, and then say, oh my, this is what I need to investigate. You have to do that, but you don't have to do it in every class. I mean, you should to a large extent do it. The whole point of a curriculum development program was that you take, because it takes a long time, it takes over two years, maybe two and a half years, sometimes three to depending on, you know, the logistics, etc., to be able to design the curriculum. And then you need to fine tune it thereafter. For example, so, I mean, I don't have a formula of at age this, this, etc. you know, you could, you could generalize to some extent. When can they handle two variables, for example? But if you're looking at the concept of force, you know, how do I teach it and how do I lay the foundations for it? Uh, I don't know if you're aware, there is something called a force concept inventory about all the misconceptions in force, for example. So you ask them why, when you throw a ball, why does it, you know, slow down and not throw or, or roll a ball? Why does it slow down? The force in it gets over. 
So I had asked kids, but where is the force in the ball? Um, I think it's around it, ma'am, or I think it's inside it, ma'am, right? So these are things you kind of have to do once to do that curriculum um, framework. I mean, the curriculum uh, topics AI-wise, but then there is still room for fine tuning it in the classroom if the teacher is alert and goes through the processes that I have given some flavor of. And there has to be an extremely strong feedback mechanism, which we lack currently in our country. In Israel, for example, at the end of grade four, they have a nationwide exam in mathematics and language, etc. And the results of that exam are not shared with teachers or with parents or with students. So why is this exam being conducted? They look at patterns in the answer and then they tweak the curriculum accordingly. So it's, it is, has to be an ongoing process. It has to have a very robust feedback mechanism. And te when teachers tell you, I cannot teach fractions in grade three, you have to listen to them. You cannot bring out books the next year and still have the same thing in it. Mm -hmm. So that's the only way to do it. Um, there is a next question from Sujata who says, when you designed curriculum for middle school, you took into consideration from where they are coming and where they have to go. Isn't that constraining? And are you mentioning that there is a problem with the current curriculum? Oh, yes, that's where the, the, the short answer to that is yes. Um, but see, the thing is, I had, when I joined, I took on class five. So I had, uh, again, somewhere in the back of my mind, without having any education degree or whatever, was that I knew that there were problems with understanding force. So we actually did friction first. I didn't go into all the details here, but for example, the canonical treatments are actually not quite, not at all suitable for the introductory level of the concept, right? So you have to do some, so I laid the foundations for force by dealing with friction first. That will give them an explanation of what they observe in real life. And then in grade six, we move to forces. Then in grade seven, we looked at uh, um, vector addition, but didn't, you know, just in, in one direction, in one dimension, and did give them a qualitative flavor for uh, components of forces, but we could not do any problems or anything of that nature. So uh, in grade five, I had actually, um, now when I look back, I realized that I had actually done the foundations. It was around earth, it was living together. So uh, interdependences of life, etc., And it was very easy to build on that in grade six. Once I took on the entire middle school curriculum, I started going up and down grade six and eight. I would teach grade seven and six in the same week, the same concepts, you know, it was, and every hour of teaching was 10 to 12 hours of preparation, working out, doing worksheets, trying out experiments. They all had to be low cost. I should also point out, I should also share that. I always had a Zilla Parishad school in the back of my mind, where, which are not resource rich. So everything had to be done, but there is only so much you can do with Tetra packs. You know, at some point you have to force the school to buy microscopes, buy equipment for optics, etc. Anyway, so that's a little bit of a digression. So then I could build by going up and down, I could figure out what can be taught in which uh, grade. And, and so, uh, for example, inf uh, instantaneous velocity is something they won't get in grade eight. You kind of have to push them and they're going to need that in ninth, tenth later if they're going to do calculus based physics. Right. So that is what I meant. So yeah, the short answer is the curriculum, not what it should be. I agree. And how do I, uh, why did it matter where I'm coming from and where and where I'm going? This is the answer. Okay. Uh, Neeraja has a question. Uh, do you feel the current curriculum or books give a restricted outlook towards interdisciplinary nature of science? Uh, and she says, she's sorry if you've addressed this uh, and if she has missed it. But uh, yeah, the question is if current books give a restricted outlook towards the interdisciplinary nature of science. Uh, I would have to say yes, because uh, when they talk generally about integrating uh, uh, disciplines in science, they only talk about binding those sections together, not really giving you a flavor. And the children don't care, right? If they're looking at... Um, uh, if, you, if you're teaching a concept in um, biology or physics, everything that is associated with it that, uh, that comes from their observations, that comes from their 
questioning, et cetera. They don't do it in compartmentalized way. So you have to deal with it all in your, uh, in your, in the treatment of your unit. I'm trying to see if I can think of a quick example in this. Mm. Uh, okay, photosynthesis, usually taught in biology, right? It's taught at a very young age. It's taught in grade four. I, I gave the example of uh, plants make their own food, right? But they don't understand uh, particulate nature till about grade seven. And until you do that, how are you teaching photosynthesis of carbon dioxide and water leading to sugar? So would this not be interdisciplinary if you look at it as chemistry and biology? I mean, there is this, uh, uh, was it Van, Van Helmont, D. Helmont experiment where he tried to figure out how plants grow, measuring the water, measuring the soil okay. it, and wondering where it came from. This is before chemis chemical processes were known. And yes. children would go through the same thing. So yes, it is interdisciplinary. So you have to treat it that way. You don't really have a choice. So this physics chemistry that we separate is quite artificial, at least in the introductory years, okay. I think. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, the next question is, uh, it's teacher developer Jaya. So I, I guess Jaya must be working with teachers. So uh, what do what do teachers do know? They have to go with the current curriculum. Shouldn't flexibility be given so teachers can teach as per the ability of the student. And uh, uh, there's an addition to this. But when I talk to teachers, I do tell them, there should be a discussion between the teachers about teaching various levels so that they know where the students are coming from and where they are headed. <laughs> yeah. so. so the answer to the flexibility and autonomy of teachers, I'm all for that. But you also have to make sure the teachers are um, supported in this effort, which they often are not. You, unit test one, you have to complete this syllabus. If that is the brief you give the teachers, there is no room for them to I mean, it's a very frustrating exercise, right? They know the students won't get it. The students are frustrated. But here is, and the whole edifice is actually erected for the students' sake. But you are, you have to cave in to the board. You have to cave in to the principal, to the parents. I mean, I said, including some of these problems, I, you can just name it, really, and you'll find a problem there. So yes, autonomy has to be there, but teacher has to get a support for it. Why would you go through two weeks of teaching a topic you know the students are not getting and then examine them on it when you know that there is no point in doing that except you know getting them frustrated and maybe turning them away from science? Uh, there is a question from one of our PhD students. He says, do analogies really help in learning or can they be misleading too? <laughs> there is a lot of research on that. I think um, Michael Matthews, if I remember correctly, uh, you, th there has been a lot of research on that. I have not resorted to analogies a whole lot because I think they can actually bring in misconceptions. Um, but there are people who are in favor, I mean, who are saying don't dismiss it entirely. And there I, I agree with that. Yeah. Don't have a very much more clear cut answer than this at the yeah, uh, Aparna, I think one question was missed. Uh, there's a question uh, from Purnima who is asking how much unlearning oh, yeah, yeah. do uh, teachers I, I, have to do? Yeah. How much unlearning do teachers have to do in order to bring how about a success? Unlearning. Teachers Un or students? No, teachers. A lot, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we can't forget that they've come through the same system. And they probably also have to unlearn the, the art of teaching itself, right? I mean, you, you can you have to tell them it takes time. It's not it's not going to happen overnight. You kind of have to support them. It's okay. I mean, I have I used to write diaries after my class. I would come back and you know I would have this idea which I thought was brilliant, and my colleagues would say, "Yeah, great," and it would just fall flat in class. You kind of have to you have to take that in stride. So I would write a diary at the end of every class, maybe a paragraph, maybe three or four, depending on what happened in class that day. And there were so many entries where I said, I thought this would work so well, but it turned out that these were the problems the students didn't know. So now I have to go back and correct it. So all assessment in my class was formative assessment, both of me and of the children. <laughs> so, uh, Jyotsna, this question, uh, sorry, uh, Aparna, can I? Uh, yeah, yeah. 
so Jyotsna, this is question. This question is in continuation of the first two questions about the jump in the level from going from class eight to ninth and then in the eleventh. So uh, a, a, a sort of uh, very very naive but uh, uh, a somewhat aggressive answer to this or an offensive answer to this question is uh, simply that you know we want a lot of people to pass class 10 and class 12 more easily in larger numbers but you still want them to get somewhere so let them go to a higher level in ninth fail in the ninth and then our board exams come out we come out shining because class 10 is easier than class 9 class 12 is easier than class 11 ah. so there's a jump there's a huge jump when you go from 10th to 11th and there's a huge jump when you go from 8th to 9th. Okay. I, I haven't thought of it quite that way, but I dare say you're right. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I mean, even, even you know, when, uh, when I recall my own, uh, you know, uh, stage, uh, journey. Say, class, yeah, journey, I, I, I am not sure I, I would say the same when going from class 8th to 9th, but 10th to 11th was certainly a very big jump. Okay. That's almost cheating, isn't it? It is, <laughs> but but I, I I do believe that the tenth to eleventh jump is actually quite quite a mm -hmm. big one. Which again you drop down in twelfth, yeah. Well, or stay stays roughly the same. I mean, you don't drop down, but your eleventh and twelfth you really don't uh, distinguish mm -hmm. uh, the levels. Yeah, I agree. That could very well be the motivation. It's it's. It's all about it, it's, it's a numbers, it's a numbers game. game. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just one more question, but before that, Sheetal, there was a raised hand. Correct. And Sheetal Lange, hand yeah, the, yeah. Uh, yeah. Correct. Yeah. Is she still there? I uh, or maybe she left. I don't okay. see anyway. Sheetal, if you are there, you can ask again. But Shubham has a question. Can there be driving forces for school students to learn by themselves without the help of teachers? If yes, can you name some? Uh, no, the teacher's role is so important, especially, in, I mean, we've had people come and tell us, no, I have made a set of problems where the teacher is not needed, the child can learn. But if you look at the, uh, the level of scaffolding that is needed in the early years, see, science is extremely non-intuitive if you think about it, right? What you experience is not Newton's laws. It's, the kids won't get it if you just teach them those laws. You kind of have to design the, ex the experiences that you expose them to. Uh, so it requires a lot of, um, you know, a lot of interventions, often subtle, which may not be known to the children also. They need not be explicit. And the teacher's role, I would say, is actually extremely, extremely important in the, in, in the early years, early, I mean, in school years. So I do not think that it can be completely, I mean, look, to, how much of discovery science are you going to do? Are you going to have a middle school child in three years of, or a school student in 10 years of schooling, rediscovering things that took 2000 years? You know, look at Aristotelian notions of force to Newton. I mean, are you going to be able to do that? No, you are going to need the teacher. And, and all those other classroom interactions I talked about, I mean, you cannot, you cannot uh, disregard the affective element by which means the emotional growth of a child in a science classroom. It, it doesn't work that way. You can't compartmentalize that either, right? Because one of the things that I have never seen mentioned in any science paper, that the fact that a little bit of intellectual effort leads me to the answer, which is what scientists go through every day is extremely empowering for a child, for a student. And we that is why it's very important to get, hit that zone of proximal development. Allow them to make that effort and learn, to make that conceptual change. They're not coming as blank slates. They're coming with something already there. So to the question about unlearning that of teachers that someone asked, I wanted to say, this is a process that the students also go through. It's not that they've come yeah. with no notions of any of the uh, ideas you're planting or, or teaching. They already have made up a coherent picture. Uh, there is one one more question there. I think the answer is uh, yeah. So, which part of school in India does the study belong? Is the question. I think the question is about your own work uh, in which no, part no, of the it, country. Okay. Sadly, yeah. I think we end up preaching to the choir. 
because to, the schools that are already unhappy with the current curricula the curricula are the ones who adopt our books um, ideally so one of the way things that i'm thinking of which i try to do but i should do more of is just you know put it out there for because parents have a lot of say in what goes on in schools right so just want to start telling sharing these ideas and these outcomes with with the public at large and try and bring in a change but it's i think it's still a drop in the ocean of whatever we are doing i think there are i think a um, couple of thousand books that are sold every year from the homi baba center the middle school things are not yet out as textbooks but i'm planning a different route for them and again uh, there are teachers who use them as supplementary material but not as curriculum because then the curriculum is decided by the board or uh, what the teacher you know the particular school adopts so they don't have too much autonomy there uh just now uh, in our audience there could also be some uh, teacher like there's uh, one teacher a developer jaya who already we she said she's a teacher developer but there could be also teacher trainers in the audience and uh, would you have any specific message for you know as to what elements to the teachers should need to focus on or the trainers need to uh, you know train the teachers in that teacher trainers as in ba courses is it no no these are for, for school so Sorry? the school, so we we sometimes have program where we train do some teacher training for school teachers okay yeah uh, so, so, uh, yeah. so yeah so i just uh, like to add so teacher uh, i am with the uh, royal society of chemistry teacher developer so we are okay. uh, quite mm -hmm. so uh, we do conduct specially for science teachers and in service science teachers so they are already okay. teaching so uh, when we do talk to them there is a lot that we can talk about uh, as part of our workshop so i i don't know how i would generalize that um, you know of uh, how do you train teachers i mean that's a huge book in itself right uh, but one of the things i do is um, instead of giving them demos of uh, how should i put it when i do workshops with teachers for example these little classroom um, Uh, uh, interactions that I which are, which have a positive outcome, those I do with the teachers themselves. Uh, for example, I give a problem and ask them for a solution, and they're unsure, halfway, hands up kind of stuff. Then I give them two minutes to talk to each other, and then give me the answer. And then you see there are more people answering. so this is a demo of what they should be doing in class themselves but they experience how it is when they are exposed to it this kind of stuff so i don't know if i understood your question correctly you are asking me for how to train teachers no no when no, when when teacher training is done are there any specific elements that uh, that the teachers need to be mindful of when they are talking to the students or when they are doing something in class or you know so when the textbooks have these kind of misreading things So is there something specific that you know that oh, definitely that yeah that, that okay thank you you've given me some hint of which way to go in the answer yeah um you could actually get them to look at the textbook uh, the problems with the textbook and figure out how they are going to handle that in class i mean they don't have to it's not the bible it's just a textbook yeah that would be a very important part in fact that's what i did do with in numerous teacher workshops i would get them to take a unit and it's never it, see the way you write the book also no you keep saying you want enquiry teaching in class but you do not facilitate it with, with your textbook mm -hmm. so now it's left to the teacher to redesign everything so what i do is uh, i get them to take one particular particular unit and figure out how they can teach it so i give them for example ask a uh, qualitative question ask a question which requires some quantitative thinking ask a question which requires them to push their thinking a little bit more So I give these templates and ask them to try it. I have them somewhere. I can share them if, if anyone needs. I can share them. So you kind of have to, uh, because it will be the first time any of them would be thinking along those lines. You kind of have to get them. It's, it's a little bit more structured, and then the hope is that later on they won't need that structure. But we do make these very. Um, uh, one of the things we ask in the work uh, worksheet is, what about this concept? Do you think is difficult for students? how can you address that so they have to start thinking along those lines that's something we do yes 
yeah a couple of people have already said that they would like to see these templates if you can share these sure the questions that give yeah, me some be time helpful. because everything is on portable hard disk i'll have to search for them i i'll do that and if i forget please remind me please feel free to remind me sure sure josna i had yeah. one question if i may yeah. um yeah so uh, you know in the last whatever little i have seen of textbooks and also of uh, the way there seems to be a change in the manner in which people want to teach there is a huge emphasis on what people like to call activity based learning sorry i missed the last part uh, there is a huge emphasis or a spurt in activity based learning yeah okay now you know my 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 worry is that Uh, we are simply moving from uh, uh from a need to think substituting it by simply doing something i agree uh and activities seem to be an end in themselves okay. and the need to do some abstraction to build on observations without any aids using only your brain yeah. is something that has not probably been given enough attention when people design I, these i agree things. completely actually that's why if you look remember one of my slides i always make it a point to say that by inquiry we don't mean experiments alone right it's also uh, how you situate the experiment for example in the density unit i never told children that it has to be you know it depends on the density or not mass density is a hugely hugely difficult concept while doing that we figured out volume is a hugely difficult concept we figured out there was confusion between volume and area and area mm -hmm. and perimeter mm -hmm. so you keep going back and see the problem so in any case so when you do the in, when we did the density unit for example we never told them the answer we got children to arrive at it by just cleverly designing the experiment what pairs of object you choose you ask them to predict which one will sing you ask them to look at the volume and you something as simple as See, I'll tell you one more thing. Volume as displacement of something, and volume as capacity. There is tremendous confusion between the two. So, if you have that one joy ice cream ball, no, where you can fill with water and put it in, and so on. So, you have to design the experiments in such a way that they start questioning what they were thinking, and they arrive at the answer. So, I completely agree with you. It 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 is basically it has to reflect the way scientists have actually done experiments, figure out something, and come to the. we never do that because we always i mean there are textbooks which will tell you you see this isn't it so this is what happens isn't it i mean what why are you doing the experiment <laughs> yeah so i completely agree with you experiments have to actually play the role that they are expected to play in a science class or in any scientific endeavor um and to to remove the emphasis you know the reason that it just becomes activity based is that it's the easiest thing to do right you feel you've done something So we have to chip away at these things, and it's it's not it's going to be a little bit of a long haul. <laughs> it's not going to be easy. Yeah. Uh, just now, if you don't mind, one last question. One last question, can I take? Sure, so, sure. Uh, uh, Mosmi is one of the teaching fellows in our science activity center. She says, I find that a lot of students think science refers to facts given in science textbooks, rather than the method of acquiring this knowledge itself. could you please comment on that yes so uh, you brought me to one of my favorite topics <laughs> this is is that you don't have to tell them what science is just engage them in it and they get it so one of the studies that my student and i had, had done we never explicitly told them anything about si science is this science is that you know we thought we had two simultaneous well morning and afternoon classes two groups of similar uh, groups i mean all the statistics is there in the paper and we had them teach the supposedly traditional way but much more enhanced because teachers didn't feel constrained they didn't have unit tests so they did this powerpoints and videos etc etc and then we had the inquiry based classes and if you look at uh, when we gave children diaries sort of free willing diaries and we asked them to note down whatever they felt about the class that day you know what they learned what they found difficult what they enjoyed whatever it is it's just and we didn't give them instructions up beyond that if you look at the diary entries and compare you will find a lot more tentativeness in the way this enquiry students answer the questions uh, and there was slightly more metacognitive actually we didn't say that in the paper but they say i didn't understand this part or i found this so exciting whereas in the other one you say i learned today that density is mass divided by volume 
<laughs> or in the other class it would be about archimedes was on the mission now or something of that kind so if you if you look you can't tell them what um let me draw an analogy to the person who asked the question when you teach language you expect students to be able to write in that language you expect them to be able to express in that language you don't tell them tagore did this and shakespeare did that right why do we do that in science you developing a language skill means writing in that language means thinking mean, means expressing so we have to involve in a science lesson we don't know what science is we just take the information as you can see in the textbook and we give it so once you start involving them they know it and, and that was very heartening because i have never been a big believer in teaching them uh, you know um, philosophy of science or uh, i mean to to teach them what science is to tell them the nature of science separately i thought mm -hmm. that they learn it without explicit teaching just by being involved in it okay. yeah uh, so any final comments pass as the chair of the department uh. <laughs> uh, no i i'll just like to thank jyotsna for this uh, an hour hour and a half that she spent with us and uh, i'm sure that at least some from the audience will want to talk to you further and sure. will facilitate that those of you who have uh, questions about today's talk or want to engage further with jyotsna please write to us we'll put you in touch with her i'm sitting in a yeah. very noisy environment there's a sparrow chirping away children yeah, we, we can hear that yeah. <laughs> so i didn't all hear right. all of you okay. what you said but yeah i'll be more than happy if people want to connect with me sure. i've given my email in the Also, you can share it too, and we yeah. have. Okay. Yeah. And also, there's a the, Google form. Right, right. For yeah. the audience, uh, there's a there's a form which has been posted in the chat, uh, which uh, is for those who would like to keep uh, in these activities. You have my contact details. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can yeah, share yeah. with anyone. I'll be happy to interact. All right, all right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Thank, thank you so much. much. Thanks. Thanks, Joseph. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 bye.